uh, the title of this, we've been, uh, we started this new series uh, last week, Love, Dating, and Marriage. It's uh, just a little series we're going through. It's uh, five weeks, and uh, last week we uh, jumped right in and we looked at God's view of sex. And so the title of the message was Sex, and it was very good, all right? So if you want to check that out, you can go to YouTube and, and uh, Google that up, or uh, search that up and check that out. But, but, you know, what we talked about last week was uh, sex is God's idea. And uh, when we do it His way, when we do sex God's way, you know, one man and one woman inside the bond of marriage, it, it is very good. Uh, you know, sex is not dirty and it's not wrong when it's practiced by God's design. And so we, we've got to understand that. And so, you know, we have a tendency in our culture, we look at this, to pull sex down by abusing God's original plan. Uh, but God elevates sex and He holds it to a higher standard than what we do. And uh, God blesses those who practice sex His way, okay? And so today we're going to take the next step and we're going to talk about marriage, all right? Uh, next week we'll talk about dating. Uh, Pastor JJ is going to be preaching next week. Then we'll talk about uh, temptation and purity. Uh, but today we're going to talk about marriage. Two become one. All right. And the, and the key scripture today, if you want to uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you want to note that, we'll be looking at a few different passages. But Genesis chapter 2, right from the beginning. Uh, you know, we understand, you know, God really gives us some pretty clear instruction on marriage. And so... Uh, one of the passages that, that uh, uh, are, refers to marriage exclusively is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. And in, in that verse, uh, God says marriage is a sacred bond. And, you know, when we practice God, uh, mar uh, marriage God's way, we get God's blessing on our marriage. But, uh, you know, it's real easy, uh, I think, in our society to believe some myths and some misconceptions about marriage, okay? And so... Uh, right off the bat, what I want us to do is I want us to kind of dismiss three common misconceptions about marriage uh, before, we, before we jump in fully on what we're talking about. Number one, one misconception about marriage is, is we, we have to understand this. A lot of people think, you know, well, I have to be married to be happy, okay? And so uh, let, let's throw that out because uh, God never said you have to be married to be happy. You know, uh, being single is a perfectly legitimate direction in life. God blesses singleness, and if you're single, you can still get all of God's blessings from life. God says you can be happy with or without another person. You don't have to be married to be happy. As a matter of fact, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and you may want to do that, uh, it seems that Paul indicates there that that God actually, uh, you know, it may be better for you to remain single because then you're exclusively dedicated to God and you can be used greater for His service, okay? And so you don't have to be married to be happy. You have to be have a relationship with Jesus to be happy, okay? As long as you've got a relationship with Him, uh, you, you can be blessed, all right? Number two, another misconception common <coughs> that we see is, is um, I want you to look at this, a, su a successful marriage is all about being in love, okay? And they notice I put the all in all caps there, and there's a reason for that, because, you know, successful marriages, they begin with feelings, but they're, they're maintained, successful marriages are main, maintained by more than feelings, okay? Uh, there's got to be a conscious decision, a real commitment to stay with one another. It's not just about love, okay? Uh, sometimes in marriage, you know, let's be honest with you, sometimes you don't feel the love. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, sometimes in marriage you may feel anger. Sometimes you feel hurt. Sometimes you feel disappointed. As a matter of fact, sometimes you don't feel anything. And, and our culture a lot of times will say, hey, when the feelings are gone, that means you need to, to, to go on and get out of that marriage and find somebody else, you know. Uh, but let, let me tell you something. Successful marriages, they aren't built on feelings. Successful marriage, look, let me, let's me let make sure we're clear on this. Love is not a feeling that you feel when you feel like you've never felt before. That's not what love is. Love is a verb. Love is something you do. Love is action, and love is the action of putting someone else before yourself. When you love someone, you put their needs and their desires before your own. That's what love is. It, it, and there's feelings involved. There's all kinds of emotions involved. God created us as emotional beings, and so there's all kinds of emotions that are involved. But successful marriages are built on that type of love and that commitment to one another. It's much as an act of the will 
uh, as it is a feeling of the heart, okay? And so it's not all about being in love, and you don't fall out of love. You decide who you're going to love, and you decide who you're not going to love, okay? And misconception number three, a lot of times we, we look at this, you know, we think I have to marry the right person. And so, you know, or we, we feel like maybe we've married the wrong person, okay? We kind of get that. And that's usually how the line starts, you know, when somebody feels like their marriage is falling apart. I hear it all the time. You know, I really feel like I've married the wrong person. That, that's what's wrong. Uh, you know, but uh, a lot of people feel that way for some reason. A man was uh, flying on a plane, and he looked over at the man next to him, and he noticed his wedding band was on the wrong finger. And he said, hey, he says, uh, man, your, your wedding band is on the wrong finger. And the, and the man says, that's okay. He says, I married the wrong woman. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people feel that way for one reason or another. I, you know, I know. Right? Uh, but anyway, but what I want to show you this morning is this. You know, if you're a Christian and you marry a Christian, it's really impossible for us to marry the wrong person. That might sound crazy, but we're going to look at what the Bible says about marriage. And to do this, what I want us to talk about this morning is really it's called the math of marriage, okay? And uh, the math of marriage, and that's two become one. One plus one equals one, all right? That's the math of marriage. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And so I want to give you a little bit of a preview about where we're going. Now, I've got two sheets of paper over here. And what I want you to see this morning is uh, this piece of construction paper represents me because it's blue. And this one right here represents Christy because it's red. <laughs> They didn't have paint, all right. So, so uh, but anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to this is glue, and and so when when 22 years ago, we uh, we got married, all right. And when we got married, God put His there was something supernatural that happened, and God put His blessing on on our marriage, and 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 His blessing just it just covered our marriage, all right. And and what we've got here is we've got we've got two. And when we, when we got married before, before God and everybody in our family and all of our friends, God united us with His blessing. Y'all see that? And so, so the two, in a sense, become one right there. All right? And so let, let's, let's remember that. I want you, I want you to see that. Um, you know, before we got engaged, we, we dated for about two and a half years. Really, we dated for three and a half years. Uh, but the last year we were engaged, okay, so there's a little bit of distinction there, but uh, we were engaged for a little over 12 months before we got married, but, but this, this is what happened, you know, uh, something supernatural happened when we got married, and uh, God put his glue all over our marriage, and, um, you know, if we're going to understand the math of marriage, we have to look at it in, in uh, different stages, okay, and so, that's what I want us to look at today. We're going to skip the dating stage because JJ's going to talk about that next week. And, and we're going to jump right into stage one, which is the engagement. Now, the engagement phase of marriage. Now, everybody in our culture pretty much probably understands this, but uh, one plus one in engagement equals two when you're engaged. All right, one plus one equals two when you're engaged. And uh, now, what, uh, one thing I want us to understand is that really the engagement like we do today is not mentioned in the Bible, okay? Uh, it's more of a, a modern cultural thing. Um, but it is a result of this dynamic that God set in motion from the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 when he created man and woman. Uh, look, let's look at that uh, passage that we're going to be concentrating on. Look at, the, at verse 18. It says, God says, it's not good that the man should be alone, so I will make a helper fit for him, or a helpmate from him. And so then he talks about how God had made male and female of all the animals and all those things. And down in verse 21 it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he was asleep he took from his ribs and his flesh, and the, in verse 22 it says, He made a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, It's bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and so on. And so, now, in verse 18, you see, it's not good that man should be alone. That's where I want us to focus right here for a second, because this is the dynamic that God created. God made it so that men and women are attracted to one another, okay? Uh, some of y'all probably noticed that. And, and, you know, and for a lot of us, you know, it, 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 you know that's what happens. And what happens is, eventually, uh, you know, that attraction will lead to a desire uh, to... 
to uh, unite, okay? And so uh, we go through that process, and, and today we kind of, you know, we jump into this engagement period. We, we try to find someone who we think is a person we might want to spend the rest of our lives with, and, and then we become engaged, right? That's kind of how we do things. And so an engagement is a time uh, for couples to deal with all the history that they're bringing into the marriage, okay? Because what we have is we have one plus one, and so each person has all this history in their past. Uh, you know, uh, people they've dated, how they were raised, you know, all their background, their career goals, uh, you know, what they're going to do in the future, all these things they're bringing, and each one brings their own set. And so during that engagement time, it's time for those two people to think about how uh, they're going to bring those two histories together. And so an engagement period is really a period to try to figure all that stuff out. But unfortunately today, I think a lot of engagements, they, they don't work through these things. They just, uh, you know, uh, decide to get married and they push toward the ceremony. And, and sometimes they find out the hard way after the marriage is over that things weren't like they thought because they don't deal with all those things up front. And so that's really what the engagement process is. And, you know, the first thing I do when I counsel couples is, you know, I say to, I, I tell them that. I say, look, now's the time for you to kind of work through things, and, and I'm going to try to help you raise some red flags that might uh, help you decide whether you really want to be married or not. And, and, you know, I tell them, if I can talk you out of being married, then you don't need to get married, right? And so it's better to find out now than it is after you're married, right? Because, because divorce is a lot harder thing than breaking off an engagement, all right? And so... No, but hey, it, it comes across as a little strong, but hey, that, that, that's just the, it just works better that way. So, so, um, but the Bible gives us some guidance on, the, on, on engagement and how to work through things. And, and so one of the things the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.14 is uh, for us not to pair up. You know, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Uh, this is, this is that, that prohibition there. He says, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what does fellowship what fellowship has light with darkness and so when when you're in this stage of one plus one equals two in this engagement uh, phase you have to you know deal with this spiritual dynamic inside your marriage and, and and this is a prohibition really and so what I think the biggest thing we see here is that Christians really have no business marrying non-believers and so uh, you know Look, it's really just simple. It's just God's wisdom for us more than anything else. If you're, let's think, just picture it like this. If you're a Christian and you marry an atheist, how are you going to raise your children? Are your children going to believe in God or are they not going to believe in God? I'll tell you what's going to happen. If the man is the atheist, probably your children are not going to believe in God because for some reason, you know, I think it's a lot because of God's design, the father has more weight in the family of what the kids do and believe. And so that's why it's so important for us to win men uh, to Christ. Because, you know, but anyway, it's just not wise. And so a lot of times we, we feel like God's just a big killjoy, you know, when He gives us all these don'ts. And, you know, but every don't in the Bible carries with it God's deep concern for your well being. We've got to understand, you know, God's not doing this just to keep us from from having pleasure, but he's, he's given us don'ts so He can protect us and so we can be blessed by Him. And so we just have to trust Him. And so another thing that we do inside the engagement period is we, we have to try to work things out to, uh, and learn how to live with one another, how to, how to make peace, right? Because if you're going to be married, you've got to learn how to have peace with one another. And 1 Peter 3.11, it says, Work hard at living at peace with others. Now that's a verse for marriage, ain't it? You know, we've we got to be at peace. And, um, and so, uh, you know, and here's what the verse doesn't say. And this is, this is something God doesn't say. And, you know, it, it doesn't say that in order for us to learn how to live together and learn how to be at peace with one another, it, it, is, uh, it doesn't say that we need to move in together before we're married, Okay. Uh, and, and look, it's just dangerous. Did you know that studies show that cohabitation <laughs> before marriage is actually a greater predictor of divorce? What that means is people who live together before being married actually divorce at a greater rate than the people who don't live together before marriage. You know, and and that's, just a, that's just a scientific study. But, but in order for us to learn to live at peace, it doesn't mean we have to live together. But... But that's what this whole stage is for, is for us to figure out whether we want to live together or, you know, or not, okay? And so that's stage one, the, the engagement. One plus one, it still equals two. There's still that figuring out. You're not married. 
Uh, but you're trying to learn one another and you're trying to decide whether you're going to be fit for one another for life, okay? And now stage two, I want, what I want us to talk about is the actual ceremony, okay? And uh, let me say this, there's so much to do with marriage, there's no way I could hit it all today, but I just want to kind of hit some of these high points. And I want us to talk about what this ceremony means and the act of being married and what, it, what it's about. And a lot of times when we think about the wedding ceremony, we, we think about you know, this civil thing, this legal contract where two people are brought together and they're bound by this contract. And we think about them remaining as two individuals, but, you know, they're brought together because of a contract. But, you know, in God's eyes, it's not just a contract. What it is is it's a spiritual commitment. It's, it's, it's a, a, a covenant. It's a spiritual covenant. And, and so... Uh, there's difference between a covenant and a contract is that with a contract uh, either person can can uh, bow out of the contract whenever they want but with a covenant uh, there's no bow bowing out okay uh, it, it's permanent all right and so uh, and, and that's what that's what happens when we're married the math of a, of a contract says one plus one equals two but the math of a covenant says one plus one equals one you know what it is is it's a merger. It's a merger. You know, if you have two businesses that merge together, you have this business and this business, and when they come together, this business no longer exists, and this one no longer exists. They make one, a new one that does exist. That's what happens with a merger, and that's what happens with a marriage. You know, the two entities before now exist as one. And that's exactly what God says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. He says, um, excuse me, down in, where's it at? No, verse 24 is where I want to go. <laughs> Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I had it wrong on my notes. That really throws me off. Sorry about that. But that the two shall become one flesh. And so two become one. The two are united in, as one. And so, uh, and so when we look at this, uh, you know, and in the verse 25 it, it speaks of the physical. All right? But this is more than physical. This is, this is a spiritual thing. And it's a spiritual commitment, and, it, and it's, a, it's a complete uni uniting of two as one, okay? So marriage begins as two separate individuals from two separate families, and they come together to form a new family. And the imagery of two coming together as one, that's, that's real powerful. I mean, it, and, you know, uh, making one family out of two, and, and you know, it sounds kind of romantic, doesn't it? But, but you know what? It's really not that romantic because of everything that's happening. When you think about it, it's really kind of hard and difficult. It's, it's a painful process because for two people to become one, uh, that means that each one of those individuals, they have to become less to equal one. Now hold with me there for a minute and hopefully, hopefully we can explain this. You know, in order for us to equal one, we have to become less. And so what, what I mean by that is, you know, actually when you get married, you become more because you're adding another person to your life. But in order to be married, you have to become less because you have to give something up. And you have to be willing to sacrifice, okay? And there's, there's no way two people can become one without sacrifice. And, and so that's what we're talking about. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, you remember he was about 30 years old, and John the Baptist was his precursor, right? And John the Baptist was preaching, and he had all these people that were following him. And then when Jesus came and he started preaching, all of John's followers, pretty much, they left John and they started following Jesus. And some of John's uh, friends, they come to him and they said, Hey, you know, look what's going on here. Well, you're going to have to do something to try to get some followers back. And John said, no, he says, I have to become less so he can become greater. And in the same way, when we enter into the covenant of marriage, we have to become less so as a couple we can be greater, okay? And so here's what, here's what I'm talking about. You see, I have to become less as an individual so we can become greater as a couple. And so um, the things that were mine are, are no longer just mine. You know, now they're ours. It's, and so let me give you a few illustrations. Christy and I, we've been married for 22 years now, and I've learned a lot over the years. You know, uh, whenever we first got married, uh, you know, before, excuse me, before we got married, you know, I pretty much decided what I wanted to do with my time, and, and uh, you know, uh, I did what I wanted to most of the time. But once we got married, you know, uh, things changed. And I'm not saying now I can't do things apart from her. I can, as long as I ask first, all right? Uh, but, but, you know, but, but 
our time is each other's time, right? We, we, we work together on our time. And, and it's the same thing with money. Before we got married, uh, you know, my money was mine, and I did with it pretty much whatever I wanted to. I bought what I wanted to, and I knew how much I made. And now I still know how much I make. I make $20 a week, and she gives it to me every Monday, all right? Uh, but, 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 you know, <laughs> but really, I mean, it's not that bad, trust me. But, 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 but what I'm trying to show you is, you know, uh, what you know, her money, her her money, or my money's her money, and her money's her money, right? But no, <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> that, that's the way it works. Uh, but but you know, um, what I'm saying is, you know, there's a merger, and everything that we have, we share, and you know, and and so I have to become less, and um, you know, and and it's the same thing with the physical. You know, like my, even our bodies are no longer ours, but they belong to our mate. And and, the Bible, and Scripture says that. We talked about that a little bit last week. But two becoming one also means marriage is not about finding the perfect maid. It's not, not really about finding the soulmate. You know, we talked about earlier the myth of, of finding Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And, you know, it's not really about finding that per perfect person that we can live the rest of our lives with. You know, it, it's really a process where God changes you on the inside to make you into the perfect mate, okay? So here, here's what I'm saying. You see, you don't find Mr. and Mrs. Right when you're dating. You know, you don't really date to find Mr. and Mrs. Right. That's what everybody tries to do. But what really happens is you become Mr. and Mrs. Right. You know, I have to change. You see, when you're married, God works, works on you and turns you into Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. You don't find them when you're dating. That hap you know, what happens is when you give yourself to Jesus and you allow Him to change you, then you become Mr. Right or Mrs. Right for your spouse. You follow me? So you don't look for them. You let Jesus transform you into who that person is. And, and hopefully He's doing the same thing with your spouse, okay? And, you know, some of you here today, and, you know, maybe you're wondering, you're thinking, hey, did I marry the right person? Did I marry Mr. Right or did I marry Mrs. Right? Well, well, here's the truth. You know, once you put that wedding ring on that other person, in God's eyes, they are Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. Okay? So when you ask the question, did I marry the right person? The answer is yes. Because, you see, whoever you marry, it's God's intention for you to spend the rest of your life with that person. All right, that's that's God's plan. All right, and, and so and it's your responsibility not to go around trying to change them uh, because you can't do that. You can't change them, but you know, but but your responsibility is to let God change you and turn you into the spouse that you need to be to make your marriage the best it can be. Okay, that's your responsibility, and and so. You know, one of the reasons a lot of marriages fail is because couples never really want to do what it takes to move to stage two. And this is literally, I believe, what happens. Couples always say one plus one equals two. A lot of them never merge. They never unite because they never become less. They never become that mate who's constantly loving their spouse, putting their needs first, and denying their own. That's why a lot of marriages fail, you know. They want to stay at 1 plus 1 equals 2 because that's easier. <laughs> it really, but, but they don't want to go to 1 plus 1 equals 1 because that takes sacrifice. But the key to lifelong marriage is allowing God to make you into the right person. Learning to put your spouse's interest in front of your own. And listen to this. Learning to sacrifice. Learning to be kind. Learning to be patient. Learning to be forgiving. Learning to be submissive. Uh, being, uh, and above all, loving your spouse like Jesus loves you. You see, the marriages that are last, that will last, they have uh, spouses who love their mate like Jesus loves them. Because you know what? Jesus loves us so, you know, in a way that it does, he, it, it, when we're unfaithful to Him, he, he doesn't kick us out. He still loves us. And His arms are open wide and He receives us back, doesn't He? 
and, and, and when we get angry with Him, He's always there, ready to forgive. That's the love of Jesus. Jesus is always there. He never, never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always got us. He's always loving. He's always giving. That's Jesus. That's His love. And if we're going to have faithful, lasting, successful marriages, that's the way we have to love our mates. Love, Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. See, love, the love of Jesus is what makes the marriage. You know? It really is. So, stage one, one plus one equals, one, equals two. That's, that's the stage of engagement. Stage two, one plus one equals one. That's the ceremony, right? I want us to look at stage three. And stage three is the ever after. You know, it's, it's, you know we're not talking about the fairy tale, uh, happily ever after thing. But in a sense, maybe we are. But... But stage three is what we consider the ever after kind of stage. And, and in this stage, one plus one really equals a lifetime. It's a lifetime commitment. And it's difficult. And it doesn't mean your marriage is going to be perfect. No marriage is perfect, is it? I mean, there, there, there's, there's going to be ups and downs. And, and Bill Cosby, he's talking about marriage. He said for two people in, in a marriage to live together day after day is unquestionably the one miracle the Vatican has overlooked. All right? Uh, you know, but it, it is amazing, really, when you think about you know a lifelong commitment. It won't be trouble free or perfect. But here's the thing: if you live out your marriage the way that God plans, you know your your marriage is going to be blessed. And that's why in Mark 10, Jesus said, in summing it all up, he he kind of went back and he says God's plan was seen from the beginning of creation. And he goes back to that Genesis 2 passage and he says, for he created the male and female. And he says, this is why a man leaves his father and a mother and he's joined to his wife. And, and so they, they, they leave each other and they're joined together, just like I did with this paper. And he says, they're no longer two. This is no longer two. This is one. And he says, let no one separate them, for God has joined them together. That's the math of marriage from Jesus. And so, you know, earlier when I, when I put these things together, they become one. You know, this is the image of what happens. One becomes one. And you know what happens when we try to separate them? Look what happens when you try to separate these two now. This is what happens. You cannot, they can never be the same. You cannot separate this uh, and, and, and put it back like it was. It, it's impossible. And, and when we force it, you can see there's collateral damage. And the real reality of this is, you know, it, it's broken hearts. You know, and here's, here's the thing. You know, I've seen many people suffer the pain of divorce. And it hurts. And it hurts their kids. It hurts their families. And, and many of you, pro not, probably all of us in this room at some point or another, you know, we've been affected by divorce. And uh, many of you have lived with this pain of divorce. Some of you were brought up in the pain of divorce. But you know what the good news is? God forgives. God forgives. And listen, you can't go back and you can't undo and you can't redo. And, and so we all know that, but, but you know what you can do? You can move forward where you are in your relationships now. Wherever you are. Be, be faithful where you are today. That's what you can do, isn't it? And, and that's what we need to do. Be faithful in your marriage now. Be faithful in your relationships now. Whatever stage you're in, you know, pre-engagement, uh, engagement, married, divorce, whatever it is, be faithful where you are. That's the thing, because, because God still loves you, He'll forgive you, and He's still got a, a good plan for your life. He's still got a bright future for you. He's got a purpose for you. And here, here's, here's God's best plan is one man, one woman, together for lifetime. That's, that's, his, that's his plan. And, and, you know, we have a tendency to mess up a lot of his plans, don't we? That, you know, marriage is just one of them. Our, our relationships with the opposite sex, that's just one of them we mess up a lot, right? Uh, but, but this is what God says. And so when we submit our marriage to God, 
you get God's blessings. And you know, a lot of us in here today, we've stood before a, uh, you know, a bunch of our friends and family at a church, and uh, we've committed our marriage to God. And uh, some people think, hey, that one time, that, that, was, that was enough. And there was one guy who said, hey, he said, I told my wife I loved her when I got married, and if anything changes, I'll let her know. But, but that's, that's not it, is it? I mean, you can't, you can't look at it that way. It's not a one-time-and-done deal. You, you have to make that commitment to love every single day. Every single day. In Psalm 127, 1, the psalmist writes this. He says, Unless the Lord, Yahweh, builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. You see, the Lord has to build your marriage. The Lord has to be the center of your relationship. And unless the Lord, Jesus Christ, is at the center of your relationship, uh, you know, it's going, to have, it's going to have trouble, all right? It's going to be full of trouble. And so in order to, for us to make our marriage the most successful it can be, we've got to have fellowship with the Father at the center of our relationship, don't we? And so, look, if your marriage is going to be right and your relationships are going to be blessed, you've got to have a relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to give an opportunity for people to respond to the message at this time. But look, and so if our, our praise team will get ready, you know, that's where it starts. You have to have a right relationship with Jesus. And so, you know, a lot of you here today, you know, you, you've got broken relationships. Maybe you've had messed up relationships and, and maybe you've not felt God's forgiveness or maybe 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 you've been disobedient now and, and you know, and, and things are really messed up. But, but look, if you've never turned your life over to Jesus, then if you've not experienced that perfect love that He has to offer, then maybe you want to do that today. Okay? Because that's how you're going to have the right kind of marriage. That's going to ha be how you begin a right relationship with your spouse. You have, it has to begin with a right relationship with Jesus. And so let's do that today. Let's, let's stand together. Father, we come before you right now. Lord, we give you this time where we pray that... Uh,